Don't be sedity. I want to say good morning. good morning. All right, all right. It's a blessing to be here uh, on this morning, and definitely uh, I've been blessed by the service uh, thus far, and definitely uh, are grateful for those who've led in song and in prayer. Uh, and definitely we pray that God has been pleased with our service and our worship uh, and our honor to him uh, thus far. Uh, I come to you from the North Colony Church of Christ. Uh, someone asked me how, uh, we were talking a little bit uh, earlier about how I got into ministry. And so uh, I, I believe I climbed up, uh, the phrase that I use is I feel like I climbed up some other way. Uh, my major in college was business administration. I got a finance job and I moved to Irving and that's how I came to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. While I was at uh, my job, and at that particular time I was uh, number one in my department and uh, I was feeling pretty good about myself. It was Monday morning and my coworker came into the office. And when he came into office, he says, hey, listen, I need to tell you something. I said, yeah, what's going on? He said, you don't belong here. You know, them fighting words, but I ain't, you know, <laughs> I'm a Christian. <laughs> Uh, he, said, he said, you don't belong here. He said, no, 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 don't get me wrong. He said, you're good at what you do. He said, it just feels like you belong somewhere else. He said, but that's all. It's just, it's just look like you, you're supposed to be somewhere else, not here. And then he walked away. That was on Monday. All day Monday, I was bothered. All day Tuesday, I was irritated. Wednesday, I was curious. Thursday, I didn't know what was going on. On Friday, when I walked into work, I had a big old bag, and I took everything off my desk, and I put it in that bag because I knew this is the beginning of the end. I went and drove, and I spoke to my father. I said, I don't know. Something's wrong with me. I'm, I'm troubled. He started asking me questions. He asked me who I who, who are you? And he was, we were going back and forth and I didn't understand. At the end of that conversation, he asked that question one more time and he asked the same question maybe four times throughout the conversation. But that last time when he asked, he said, uh, son, who are you? And I said, I'm a gospel preacher. He said, well, stop climbing up the wrong tree. Because if that's not where God has called you to be, you're going to waste all that time and all that energy in the wrong place. You need to, and then you got to spend all that time climbing back down and get into the place where God has called you to be. I don't know where you are on this morning, but if spiritually you're not in the right place, if you're doing something God didn't call you to do, you're wasting time. And it's imperative that each and every one of us we not only hear the voice of God, but we start doing right now because time, life is but a vapor. It only appears for a little time. And if you're wasting time, treading water, and doing things that God didn't call you to do, you're wasting the most precious gift he's given you, which is time. Amen. This year we'll be celebrating 15 years in the colony. Uh, like I said, I didn't plan on being a preacher. I moved to the colony, I bought a house in the colony. Uh, after about uh, two and a half months of living there, I met the very first person there in the colony, which was my next door neighbor. She was a Pentecostal preacher, and she said, where did you come from? And because I was a good Christian, I said, I'm coming from evening service, you know, back in the day. Uh, and she said, um, she said, oh, well, we have services in our home sometimes, too. I said, well, uh, I said, well, that's nice. She said, well, you're welcome to come. I said, well, I would love to come. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Very first person that I met, I got invited to a Bible study uh, uh, with my next door neighbor. That next week, I walked next door, uh, and I walked into that living room, and she was reading favorite scripture. She had her niece, was a, uh, who was a delinquent Catholic, uh, and they were all sitting there reading, and I'm sitting there, uh, and we're going back and forth. And then after about 15 minutes, I said, well, if you don't mind, do you mind if I share something with you? They said, yeah, go ahead. I said, uh, if you could turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we begin in verse 1. Uh, Moreover, brother, I declare unto you the gospel, and I started sharing the gospel with them. Uh, my medical condition, many of you know, my wind is long, so about an hour and a half later, uh, I, after sharing, she slid on the floor. She said, I've never heard this before in my life before. For the next hour, she began to ask me questions, and they began to ask me questions. And from there... Uh, it was about 9.30 at night. They both looked at each other and said, we need to be baptized. I said, well, wonderful. The problem is there's no Church of Christ in the colony. 
and I don't know anybody in the colony. So now I'm having to search, where's the nearest church? And it's 9.30 at night. I called Brother Willie Franklin, he was in Louisville at the time, and I said, hey listen, I have two precious souls that wanna be baptized. Do you mind if you open up the church building where I can go and do the baptism? He said, I'll see you there. It took us about 30 minutes to get to the next town and get to the next church, uh, which is the Louisville Church of Christ. And we had our first two baptisms. As we was walking out, we were celebrating and jumping. You know how you skip after baptism. You do a little skip. And they said, hey, do you mind coming over again and teaching us again? I said, I would love to. Went over the next day. After that Bible study, they said, hey, do you mind coming over again and teaching us again? I said, stop flirting with me. I will see you tomorrow. I walked over the next day, but between the second and the third Bible study, I prayed to God and something was heavy on my heart. I called my father and we prayed. I called several other preachers, we prayed. I walked over on the third time, I said, hey, before we begin this Bible study, I need you to do something. I was 26 years old, didn't know nothing. I said, hey, listen, if you give me one week, just give me one week, we'll have services in my home. And we're gonna plant a church here. They said, we're with you. I said, well, great. Now I gotta go Google where they get them communion trays from, because Walmart don't sell communion trays. <laughs> I gotta, you know, why I do this to myself? Uh, that next week, uh, we had had our very first worship service, and that was 15 years ago. So I definitely welcome each and every one of you on September the 30th and October the 1st uh, in the colony. Like I said, we're the only Church of Christ in the colony. Uh, we definitely encourage you and invite you to come celebrate with us uh, on that Saturday at 6 p.m. and October the 1st, uh, where we'll be uh, thanking God for what he has done and the hundreds of baptisms and restorations and life-changing decisions that have been made uh, uh, because of that, uh, that moment and that time. So we just want to thank God for that. We'll be in 1 Samuel chapter 16. I'm so thankful uh, for your minister, his relationship with me his trust, uh, and uh, how we pray together, how we encourage one another. Uh, uh, Brother Steve has definitely been a blessing uh, to me in my ministry. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and beginning at verse 1. Some of you may have for, uh, forgotten, and I know sometimes everybody doesn't bring it uh, to worship. Uh, some people leave it in their car. Some people leave it in their bag. Some people decide not to just carry it at all. Uh, but if you don't mind singing a verse of a song with me with a smile, if you don't have your smile with you, that's okay. But if you don't mind just singing a verse of a song with me uh, uh, with a smile, uh, amen. And then we'll dive into the text. We sung it earlier, and I just, when he sung it uh, earlier, I just, uh, I enjoy the song. Uh, some of you may know this about me. Now, I not only like the song, I like the questions in the song. I like how the song gives an answer to all the questions, and just the goodness. And it always gets me in the mood uh, to talk about Jesus. So uh, let's sing a few questions uh, and, a, and an answer. Uh, and then we'll dive in First uh, Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. First question. Why did my Savior come to said unto Samuel, how long will you mourn? I'm in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and beginning at verse 1. And the Lord said to Samuel, how long will thou mourn for Saul? 
And I need you to understand something about Saul. And I need you, for those of you who are taking notes, I need you to uh, emphasize the next word, which is rejected, uh, depending on what translation uh, that you're reading. He tells Samuel, I don't understand why you're still hurting over somebody I've moved away from. I want that to resonate in your spirit. God says to Samuel, I don't understand. I understand mourning. I understand feeling sad when somebody leaves your life. It is human nature that when you gain an attachment with somebody, uh, that you create some bond and you feel certain things for them. Uh, but God says to Samuel, me and you are together. And I understand that Saul will no longer be uh, amongst us and with us. He is no longer a part of my plan. Uh, I gave you some space to cry. I gave you some space to kind of gather yourself and get yourself together. But the problem that I'm having is I'm looking at the clock and I don't understand why you're still crying over somebody that God says that I've moved away from. Now, if I move away from somebody, uh, another way of saying it, when God moves, you need to move. And sometimes we gain attachments or we have connections with people who are no longer living godly. They are no longer living holy. They're not trying to walk after God. And you still say, oh, they're my best friend or, or I'm going to I'm going to ride with them. And it doesn't matter what they do. See, there's a problem with that. See, I may love you, but if you walk away from God, I need you to understand it. it'll put a strain on our relationship. And I love you. And I love you from the bottom of my heart. But if you walk away from God, it doesn't mean I'll mistreat you. I won't gossip about you or talk about you. I try to tear you down. I just need you to understand I will always be with God and I'll never choose you over God. Some of you, you love your children, don't you? <laughs> you love your children, you know, uh, and, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what uh, some parents have it in their mind. It doesn't matter what my child does. I'll always support my child. My mother and father had a co very important conversation with me. My mother and father says, listen, we love you and we love your brothers and sisters. But if you ever walk away from God, you can never come back to this house until you give your life. Now listen, my mama said, listen, I'll check on you. I'll make sure you have something to eat. I'll make sure you have some clothes. We'll talk on the porch, but it is unbiblical for you to be in my house and fellowship in my house and you've betrayed God. Mama ain't do nothing yet. We just warning you. <laughs> we just warning you. We need to make it very clear of, of, of your father and I, our devotion is to God. We will always be responsible for you. If you ever need us, we will be there for you. If you ever get in trouble, we will be there to support you. But if you walk away from God, we will have to do it at a distance. Our relationship will be strained because we will always be with God and we will never choose you over God. So God comes to Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and Samuel is mourning and God is questioning Samuel about the length of his mourning. I'm not mad that you're crying. I'm not mad that you're mourning. My problem is I have clearly emphasized this word rejected him. So if I've rejected him at some point, we need to gather ourselves together and we need to move on with life. Some of y'all still got old pictures of old people that you miss and you looking under your bed and looking at old Polaroids and or you are going on Facebook checking up people that you really need to let, let go. I saw you on Facebook. The Bible says... I've rejected him from reigning over Israel. He says, fill thine horn with oil and go. And I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. I need you to know right now, Saul is in position as king. God has rejected Saul, but he didn't lose his job. Think about that. 
God says, I've left him, even though currently right now he's operating as king, but God is not with him. You know what that lets me know? God will let you stay a husband, a wife, a boss. Uh, God will let you stay in your position. God will let you stay in your house. God will let you have all of the amenities of this world. And God can leave you. And there's nothing about your physical environment that can change. That's scary to me. Because I want to be with God. I hope you want to be with God too. But sometimes God will leave you quietly and nothing about your environment has changed. Sometimes we try to look for signs of why God's not with us. So if you have financial problems, then you repent. Or maybe if you have relationship problems, maybe God is not with us. Or, or maybe if you have health uh, concerns, or maybe if there's some other things that's going on in your environment or with your children, you start to wonder. And so what we end up doing is we end up looking at physical things to determine if we're blessed by God. So if my money is right, and my, and my honey is smiling, and my children are happy, and my business is thriving, and I got a good report of health, and things seem to be going well, then clearly I must be good with God. And so we look at these external things, and God says, I've rejected Saul, but he's still wearing the crown. He's still in the palace. He still, he still is protected. Nothing at this current time is threatening his life. No enemies are coming to the point where he's about to lose his kingdom. Everything is still, he still is married. He still has his wife. He still has his family. He still has his children and his daughters. All of those things are still intact. And God told Samuel, I left a long time ago. Church, I want you to be very careful not to have false confidence that just because the weather is nice and just because your gas tank is full and just because your refrigerator is running over and your family is all laughing at the table, that doesn't necessarily mean that God is in your house. He says, listen, I want you to go to another house. God is telling Samuel, I want you to go to another house. And when you get to this house, I've already chosen his replacement. And so the Bible lets us know in verse 3, and call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what you should do. And you shall anoint unto to me uh, him whom I name unto thee. He said, when you get there, I'll tell you who you need to pick. The Bible says in verse 4, uh, and Samuel did which the Lord spake and came to Bethlehem and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, comest thou peacefully? And he said, peacefully, I'm, I'm not here to bother anybody. You know how like when you see the preacher at Kroger, he ain't trying to bother you. It's not, it's not a word today. He said, I'm just passing through. I don't, I don't have a message for none of y'all. I'm not trying to trouble the land. He says, I come to sacrifice unto the Lord and sanctify uh, yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and he called them to the sacrifice. Here we are in verse six. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked. For those of you who write in your uh, Bibles or for those of you who take notes, uh, the Bible says he looked. Now, I don't know what he saw. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what he saw. I really don't. I don't know what he was looking at. I don't know, I don't know what, the, uh, what the stature was, but the Bible says he looked. Samuel looked. Samuel is a prophet from God. He walks with God. He talks with God. He's, he's close to God. And, and God says the next king is in that house. He walks in the house and the sons walk out. And the Bible says, and Samuel looked. I don't know what he saw. But the Bible says, and when they were come, that he looked on Iliad and said, <laughs> he, he, look, he, looked at the, he looked at the statue. Nah, God don't look the same way we look. I don't, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know what he saw. Can I, can I give you an illustration? Can I, because sometimes how we, we judge sometimes. Do, do you mind standing? Do, do, do you mind standing? Now, 
I know what you, I know what you're probably thinking. Could you walk through? I know what you're probably thinking. Cause, Cause Samuel looked. Now if we, if we was gonna play basketball, somebody was laughing. I didn't, I didn't say a joke. Somebody, okay, that was okay. <laughs> if we was gonna play basketball, yeah, and <laughs> and you was gonna pick somebody, I know what you're probably thinking. Hold on a second. Could you, could you stand for? <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. You would pick me. <laughs> I know I want you. And so, so what happens is sometimes we make decisions on how a thing looks. Right? We we make we make decisions based upon this looks better than this because of that. And we're trying to obey God based upon how something looks. Now, I got a mean jump shot. I know that's what you was thinking. I got a mean. You wouldn't know that just by what? Just by looking at me. And you would probably want to go with somebody who's a little, with an ungodly height. (laughs) All right? What you don't realize is I'm actually biblically the size of the Lord. The, I'm, I'm a biblical height. You read in the Bible, ungodly Goliath heights, right? But God says in this chapter, I don't look at what you look at. I don't make decisions the way you make decisions. I make decisions from a completely different place. You gain confidence by what you can see. And the just shall live by and not by sight. Thank y'all. So he comes and the sons walk in. And the Bible says Samuel looked. And when he looked, he said, surely. Oh, do you see Eliab? Surely, this is the next king. God told me to come to this address, and when I came to this address, when Eliab walked through the door, Samuel was impressed on sight. He said, ah, well, I guess my work is done. I have come, I have seen the next king. And God spoke. And the Bible says in verse 7, But the Lord said unto Samuel, don't look at his countenance or the height of his stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. Man, can I tell you what we do? Let me tell you what we do. God says, I know you. You make decisions on how it looks. Man looks on the outward appearance, and if it looks good, then there you go making decisions. And the reason why many times we conflict with God is because God asks you to have discernment and for you to pray because God does not, God is not physical. And God is not a man. God is a spirit. Matter of fact, it is a blessing for you to physically be here this morning. But you cannot worship God with your physical extensions. Your heart has to be here. It's very possible for you to walk in a room and sit down. Matter of fact, I was king of it. I could walk into a classroom and I could pull out my pen and I had my book open and I had my notes and a teacher was teaching and I was I, I, I had this disposition. I didn't know what she was talking about. I looked like and I did that disposition because if you look like you. She won't call on you. And I learned that. (laughs) 
And some of us are really good at physically being in a place. But there's a possibility somebody didn't sing this morning. There's a possibility that when it was time for prayer, do you know in worship service, you're not supposed to listen to prayer. You're supposed to pray along with. You're not supposed to observe somebody singing. You're supposed to sing with. You're not supposed to listen to me talk about God. We're supposed to read along together. We're supposed to be in the word together. You don't supposed to just watch me give or watch me do communion. We're supposed to all do it together. Everything we do in worship is something that all of us does at the same time. And so with that, God said, I don't want you just physically being here. Is your heart here this morning? I love food. And if it could be a job, I would sign up and apply. I eat all day long. I just love food. And I notice how people prepare food. And you could tell when somebody's heart, my grandmother, rest her soul, she used to get up at 5 o'clock every morning, 4 or 5 o'clock every morning, with all her grandbabies. My grandmother they lived on the farm. Uh, so we had chickens and cows and all those different things. And my grandmother would get up and she would, uh, she would bake fresh biscuits every morning. I know I wasn't supposed to do it, but in my heart I said, oh, she's on her way to heaven. And she used to, she used to, she used to uh, prepare and then do the powder, and then she had the, uh, the butter, and then she had the syrup, and that way you can mix it in because you could sop it if you wanted to, and she'll put the butter inside, and then she'll have the bacon, and sometimes she'll do the pancakes if you wanted pancakes, and she would do it so much. And then when it was time to eat, she'll get all her uh, uh, grandchildren together. Hey, y'all, it's time to eat, and we'll all line up uh, in the kitchen. And she said, okay, you can get as much. And she'll open up that oven, and she'll flip that oven. Uh, that top open and you could see the biscuits and the steam rising uh, all the way up to heaven and you could see all of the beautiful things that was happening in the kitchen and when she prepared it she prepared it with love some of you have also received uh, someone have prepared your, your plate and you could tell when somebody's heart is not in it because you know they just grab the biscuit and put it on top and then there you go and, throw, and you throw it back I don't want that <laughs> Don't just give me that. And the, the food may be good, but how you prepared reveals your heart. It, you can tell when somebody's heart is really, you can tell when somebody's really in love. Or you can tell when somebody's going through the motions. When somebody's really in love, you know what she does? She'll put sugar in your grits. Yes, she will. She'll put some sugar in your grit because she love you. When she don't love you no more, she just put the sugar on the table. You do it. <laughs> Notice the heart is where we do all of our worship and service unto God and to the people that's in our life. And for some reason, when God looked at Iliad, God told Samuel, I don't want him. I don't, I, don't, I don't want him serving with me the way, the, in the position that we put Saul in. There's something that I've seen in his heart that I don't like his heart. And the Bible, he says, I've rejected him. I've refused him because his heart has revealed. When you compare the life of Saul and David, the Bible says that Saul did not pray before he went into battle and God ripped the kingdom from him. He didn't pray. David slept with another man's wife. His, his employee. And when his employee would not go home and cover up her pregnancy, he killed him on the front line, then moved her into the house and made her another wife. And God said, David is a man after mine own heart. Saul did not pray before going over into battle. And the Bible says, and God rejected him. He eventually ended up dying on the sword. David is still talked about in the New Testament 
as the throne of David and, that, and God's heart was with him. So then I begin to realize something. What we do is we count each other's sins. We say, you did this, 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 and this. If I do less than you, then I automatically put myself ahead of you. And I say, I'm better than you because you sinned five times this week and I've only sinned twice. So what we tend to do is we tend to look at what David did and we say, oh, he did. And then we weigh what he physically did. But God already told you in 1 Samuel chapter 16, I don't look at the outward. I look at the inward. So here's the thing. Me and you tonight can commit the same sin. Me and you tonight can commit the same sin. But how God deals with me and how God deals with you is depending not on what we physically did. God weighs the heart. So even though me and you did the same thing, I may get a, a measure of grace and mercy and forgiveness uh, uh, from God that you don't receive and you won't understand it because you said, well, how is it? Because we did the same thing. And God is saying, I don't look at the outward. I look at the heart. What were you thinking when you sinned? How, how did you feel when you sinned? And, and after you sinned, did you have any regret you know, there are some people who can sin and they don't feel anything. They say, did you do that? Yes. There's some of you right now, you be on church grounds, you cuss, you a cuss before you get in the car. Somebody say, oh, and you won't even feel anything about saying a foul word. There's some of you, you feel nothing about maybe getting drunk or saying a little lie or, 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 or gossiping or being mischievous or being deceitful. You think nothing of it. You have no sorrow. You have, have you ever had, have you ever met somebody that if they've been found to do something wrong, that it's like their heart is broken. There, there are some children you really don't even have to punish. If they see the disapproval on your face, ah, it's like death. They will cry all night long. You don't, you don't have to whoop them. You don't have to touch them. You don't, you don't have to do any of those things. If you show that you, are dis that, that you disapprove by what they have said and what they have done, their heart is so pure that if they realize, oh, my goodness, I've done something wrong, they, they are apologizing all night long. They will wake up the next day and say, Mama, I'm sorry. And the... And, you know, as a parent, when you see that, you know what you say? I can work with that. I can work with a heart. That's why we say in the Lord's church, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you sin. If you can get your heart to humble before God, he'll forgive you. If somebody said, brother, you don't understand what I did. I, I had a gentleman one time. He came and he said, uh, he said, are you sure? Are you sure God will forgive me? He said, I, he said, I raped my nieces. My family won't even talk to me anymore. He said, I was, I was an alcoholic back then as well. I did some, I did some really bad things. I've, I've hurt the women in my family. You preach this gospel saying anybody can come. Is that true? And I had to say yes, but your heart got to be repentant. We think God forgives us because you say, I'm sorry. It's not what you say where God forgives. There, there are some people that may be in your life that have hurt you. And the reason why y'all are still not on good terms or the, still, the, the, the reason why there may still be a, a strain in the relationship, whether romantic or family or friends, is because even if they did apologize, you don't, you don't believe it came from the heart. Well, I'm sorry. What do you want me to do? Say it sweeter. <laughs> Say it a little softer. He says, I've rejected Iliad. The Bible says at the end of verse 7, for man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. 
Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. And the Bible says son after son came. If you know what God is looking at, God is rejecting because he's seen something in the heart. Do you know why certain people shouldn't do certain ministries? Your heart not in it. Everybody shouldn't be at the, at the door. It's a ministry to greet at the door. There's some people that need to sit down. You're frowning every time we see you. You're growling. People are scared. People, people are trying to slip into uh, the other side because they're trying to avoid you. This is not your gift. There are some people, you don't have the heart to work with children. You're over there teaching the class with the kids, and we hear you screaming all down because you done lost your patience. That's not your gift. You got to have the heart to care for children. You got to have a heart to care for people who don't ha quite have it together. You got you to gotta love God so much from the heart that you're willing to put yourself aside and say, Lord, not my will, but let your will be done. You have to, you have to die and be born again by the transforming and the renewing of your, your old mind won't get you close to God. And the reason why sometimes God rejects us or God doesn't do certain things with us, he's, I don't like your heart. There's something that I see in you. Do you know why when you first meet a person, you got to ask a whole bunch of questions? Because you're trying to figure out who, how do you think and what is your process? Because I need to determine of whether or not I feel safe with you. Do you know why some of you get away from certain people? Because the certain things, their, their words reveal their thoughts and their thoughts make you feel uncomfortable and not safe. I don't like to, some of you may be selfish. You only think about yourself. Where it becomes very dangerous. God can't give you blessings because if God sends any blessings to you, nobody else will receive them. Some of you are not givers. And if you're not a giver, then you're communicating to God that when he looks at your heart, I'll make sure to send no shipments your way. Because if I send a shipment to your house, there you go trying to wear and, and use all of it for yourself. But there are some of you, if the Lord sends anything to you, the first thought that you have is, ooh, who can I bless this with? And God says, I can use you. I like that. I like that spirit. There are some of you, you can't keep the gospel to yourself. You got to tell somebody about Jesus. Man, it burns in you. So the Lord says, I can trust you because I looked at your heart and I know that you're not some undercover Christian CIA, not trying to be revealed that you've been washed in the blood of the lamb. So with that, I can send certain people into your life. And I can send certain opportunities your way because if I let you get in the room, you're going to tell people about Jesus Christ. There are some of you, I can't trust you. I can bless you and I can give you opportunities. I can give you promotions. I can open up certain doors and let you get in certain rooms. And here's the thing. You won't say nothing about me. I don't like your heart. Because your heart's not really, your, your heart's not really here. I know I know I can be, be long winded. I have I have like three scriptures and then the lesson be yours. Is that okay? Y'all ain't doing nothing today, right? We're gonna be with the Lord all right. Amen. Very quickly, very quickly. I want you to turn your Bibles to Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah chapter 17. In beginning of verse 5, Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 5. And the Bible reads, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusts in man. Biblically, I'm not allowed to trust you. The Bible says it's foolish for me to just blindly just trust you. Oh, Brother Williams, you understand, I'm a trustworthy person. That might be true. I'll never find out. The Bible says you're cursed if you trust in man. Now, here's the thing. 
I trust in God with you. I don't trust in you outside of God. I can go to bed at night and trust that God will protect me amongst men. But I don't trust men because at any moment, at any time, you can be deceived by the adversary. So the Bible says, my trust in man is a curse and make it flesh his arm, whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness and a salt land and not inhabit it. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. Somebody says, I don't know if I, I can ever forgive that person again. You can forgive because you can trust in the Lord to handle that person if they mess up again. I don't trust in you. I trust God with you. And that allows me not to live in isolation. It doesn't allow me to live disconnected from, I'm able to walk amongst the crowd now because I don't trust you. I trust God to take care of me while in your midst. And if I ask you a question and you lie to me, I trust God to handle you, which I don't have to stress. I don't have to worry. I don't have to fight with you. I don't have to seek vengeance. I don't have to do any of that because I trust and lean on God. And you can't fully break my heart because my heart was not fully invested in you. When two people get married, you invite God in to say, hey, listen, regardless what happens with us, God, we're going to lean on you because it might be sickness. It might be uh, 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 in health. It might, it might be this. It might be that. It may be a lot of things that may come up. But God, we're inviting you in that you're going to cover us even if we're not nice to each other. We don't trust in man. We trust in, in the Lord. The Bible says, blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. Do you know the word hope is a word for the future and never the past? Which means if you're a Christian, you can never be sad about tomorrow because that is antithetical to, to who Jesus Christ is. Jesus Christ is our hope and hope is always future, which means I'm so excited about Monday because I know the Lord is already there. They're threatening to do some stuff to you. I don't worry about what they're, because I trust in him to handle them and regardless of what ha may happen with me. The Bible says in verse 8, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see uh, when he comes, but her leaves shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from the yielding fruit. You're going to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And when the weather changes, you don't have to worry about the weather because the Lord will supply you. You don't have to worry about the heat. He says your leaf will always be green and it won't match the season. And the reason why I don't match the season is because God, because you trusted in God, God said, I'll take care of you even in desert places and even in the midst of a drought, I'll make sure to always send you your supply because you trusted in me. Your heart was with me and you didn't put your heart over there. You didn't put your heart on the election. You didn't put your heart on your mother. You didn't put your heart on your job. You didn't put your heart in your bank account. And now all of your hope has dissipated because a bill came or you lost your job or you've lost your health. God says, I'm supposed to be your hope. Not the physical things that you can see. And so you know what Satan is constantly doing? He's constantly manipulating our physical environment because he's exposing all of the Christians whose hope is not in the Lord. So if your emotions all day long is doing this because of what you hear and what you see, the devil got you on a yo-yo string and he's just playing with you because your emotions is connected to what you can see. But the just shall live by faith and not by sight. So as a Christian, 
Christian, we learn to close our eyes to hear the voice of God. And when God speaks and when you get up in the morning, you should have God's word in your heart. And as you go throughout the day, you should have God's word in your heart. And when you go to bed at night, you should have God's word in your heart. And that is what anchors you. And that is what secures you. So it does not matter if on the screen tonight it comes across that America is under attack and the world is turning upside down and there's fires everywhere and a tsunami is coming on the east coast and there is a drought coming on the west coast and and everything and the money is disappearing and everything's going to bitcoin and this is happening and that is happening it doesn't matter because my hope has always been in the Lord and never in what I can see. Appreciate the three amens that I, that I got. <laughs> Amen. Here we are. Uh, my second scripture. I have three. My second scripture, Matthew chapter 6 uh, 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 in verse 1. As you go into Matthew chapter 6 verse 1, I, I just want to read... Uh, uh, I moved on a little fast. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful. Above all things, it's desperately wicked. Who can know it? He says, I, the Lord, search the hearts. And I try the reins and even give to every man according to his ways. God blesses you by what he sees in your heart. Your next blessing from God is connected to what's in your heart. He says the heart is desperately wicked, which is why we give our heart to God. In Matthew chapter 6, in verse 21, the Bible reads, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You can't fake with God. When God looks at your heart, he says, I'll know if I'm your treasure or I'll know if your car is your treasure or your pension or your house or your children or your, I know where your treasure is because that's where your heart is. Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. This is why there are some people, their heart is not really with the church or with the Lord because they put more of their heart and their energy to the things that they really treasure. They don't really care if the gospel goes out. They're not bothered if nobody gets baptized in 60 days. They don't even remember the last time the water was troubled. They don't, they, they've, they're okay if their cousins and uncles and aunties don't come to the Lord. They don't even pray for them to be saved. I'm not saying that you didn't attempt to share the gospel with your family, but I'm saying like your, your heart is not in the things of the Lord. And the Lord says, I can look at your heart and I can tell right now you're thinking about the game. Right now you're making plans about what you're going to do this afternoon and what you're going to take care of. Your heart's not really here. He said, wherever your heart is, your treasure will be at the same place. So if your heart is with the Lord, then the Lord knows that I'm your treasure. And if the Lord knows that he is your treasure, then you've just opened up the windows of heaven. You've also opened up the heart to God because now it's safe for God to give to you and to pour into you. Our last scripture, and then we'll close very quickly. Turn to Psalms 37. I think that may be a sign that I'm, <laughs> I'm preaching too long. Psalm 37. We'll read this last verse and we'll close. Psalm 37. In Psalm 37 and verse 3. Psalm 37 and verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shall you dwell in the land, and verily you shall be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord. Delight thyself also in the Lord. And the Bible says, and he shall give you the desires, not of what you say. He doesn't give you the desires 
of your soul, there are three parts of man. There's the body, there's the soul, and there's the spirit. He gives you the desires of your heart. When God looks at your heart and when you pray, and he sees that you delight in him, you enjoy singing about me. You, ain't that what you want to know if somebody like you or want to be friendly to? Like, sisters, isn't it sometimes you ask your husband, what you like about me? Some of the brothers be like, mm, don't start this. <laughs> what, do you, what do you like about, hey, don't, I want to let you know, God is the same way. Do you really love me? I know you sang the song, oh, how I love Jesus, right? I know you sing the song, but do you, but do you really love me? Like, really, do you really love me? Do you really care about me? Like, when you go to bed at night, am I the last thing on your mind? Or is it your bills? Or you love your bills? When you wake up in the morning, you think about everybody else, but you don't think about me. You don't even talk to me in the morning like you used to. You remember how you used to carry me around and you used to read and you used to want to know what my thoughts were? You don't even open up your Bible anymore to know my thoughts. It's almost like you just want me to be a genie. I'll give, you, I'll give you the desires of your heart. I'm just trying to find out if I'm your heart. Are you suffering me? You're entertaining me, aren't you? Are you entertaining me? Are you, are you waiting for me to move on so you can get back to doing what you want to do? Am I messing up your Sunday? Did you have a schedule? Did you put God and schedule God on his day? Because God is supposed to be between this time and this time. But somebody says, well, well God, you're going over schedule on your day. Do you delight in me? Because when you delight in the Lord, when you delight in the Lord, your disposition changes. There's a glow about you. There's a sparkle in your eyes. His song stays on your mouth. I don't want to just... I don't want to just preach obedience and your heart. Sometimes you can obey and your heart's not in it. You can do everything that God tells you to do, but your heart is somewhere else because you can train and teach your body to go through the motions and your desire and your heart is in another location. So if you're here this morning and if you've examined your heart, and you look through the hallways, and you look through the doors of your heart, and if there's anything that you see that's not pleasing unto God, it is my prayer, and hopefully it's our prayer, that before you get back in your car, and before you leave this place, it makes no sense if you're not right with God before we all leave. If there's anything that you need to repent of, if you've been, if you've been putting God number two, and God has not been number one in your life, God will never be your number two. He'll just remove himself off the list. God can only be number one or nothing else. If you've been putting your own agenda before God, God has given you all of those gifts and you don't use those gifts to the kingdom. You give the world the best of you. You still think Sunday is the end of the weekend instead of the first day of the week. You give the best of you to your career, and to your ambitions. And God says, but I'm the one that gave you those things for the upbuilding of my kingdom and the church and for the gospel to go out. I've never seen your heart here. You attend, but you're not here. You don't invest. You're a really good teacher, but nobody has ever heard you teach. You're a really good servant, but you never sign up to serve here. You're always doing stuff in the community, but you never bless my people. I want to know, do you really love me? If you're here and you're on the sound of my voice, I want to let you know the best decision that you can ever make is if you give your life to Jesus Christ. In order for you to do that, you have to believe that Jesus died for you and that he was buried and that he rose again. You will never have to question his devotion to you. He's just asking for you to accept it by obeying the gospel. 
And if you'll be willing to repent, Luke 13, 3, and if you'll be willing to confess, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32 and 33, if you'll be willing to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then by his commandment, the Bible says in Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized, today you can be saved and you can have all your sins washed away. You can stand anew in his kingdom. You will become a child of God. You can call him father because if you're not baptized, he's not your father. If you're not baptized, he is your creator. But if you want a relationship with him, you have to be baptized into Jesus Christ and then he will be your father and you will be a part of the family of God. And through his word and through the Holy Spirit, he will renew your mind. And those old thoughts will be replaced with his thoughts and his word. You'll dwell in his word. And the promises that's found in his word will now be available unto you. This is the, this is the portion of service where the sermon is over. And this is the portion of prayer that if there's anything we need to get right with God, let's do it. Because this might be the last time you see my face. Or this might be the last time I see yours. Wouldn't it be wonderful on this Lord's Day that we all had a heart check to make sure we're walking with the Lord? This invitation is now given unto you. I pray you receive it with your whole heart as we together stand and we'll sing a verse.